Hello, my name is Jillian Dorsey and I am going to discuss the topic of targeting parcels for stream restoration using a GIS suitability analysis. This presentation was originally composed by Daryl Krasnick as a final project in watershed management. River ecosystems provide the vital resources essential for the life of the organisms that depend on them. These critical resources have been subject to increasing anthropogenic pressures as the land is altered to suit human needs. Water quality is highly responsive to modifications in the landscape. The conversion of natural land cover to altered land use type is especially pronounced in densely populated regions such as the Lower Raritan River Watershed Management Area or WMA09. In addition, stream health is highly reactive to impervious surface area and changes can be detected in watersheds when 5% or even less of the area is impervious surface as seen in the figure. Impervious surface covers 16.4% of the entire study area. This is indicative of widespread development posing a major challenge to maintaining the, na the natural, physical, and chemical properties of streams. The study area includes the southern half of the Lower Raritan River Watershed Management Area, as highlighted on this map. This area is 1,774 square miles, with a population of 301,892 recorded in 2010. The population density is approximately 1,756 people per square mile. Section 303C of the Clean Water Act sets minimum federal water quality standards, or WQS, meaning the states have the primary responsibility establishing and revising water quality standards, which consist of the designated uses of a water body and the water quality criteria necessary to protect those designated uses, as well as anti-degradation policy. There are three tiers of anti-degradation designations in New Jersey. They are outstanding national resource waters, which maintains a water body in their natural state, category one waters, which protects the water body from any measurable change in existing water quality, and category two waters, meaning some lowering of existing water quality may be allowed based upon a social or economic justification. Surface waters in the study area are given one of two anti-degradation designations as assigned by the NJDEP. The designations either prohibit measurable changes in water quality, C1 designation, or permit justifiable measurable changes in water quality, C2 designation. In addition to the anti-degradation designation, Surface waters are classified based on the designated use and chemical water properties for each particular body of water. The study area has three distinct surface water classifications and two anti-degradation designations. C1 waters are exclusively classified as fresh water 2 non-trout. C2 waters are classified as fresh water non-trout. There are questions that need to be asked as a part of preliminary inventory. These questions are as follows. What is the spatial distribution of land use and land cover, or LULC, in the study area? What anti-degradation designations are applied to streams in the study area, and where are they located? Where are protected parcels located? What type of protection is offered, and who controls the parcels? Where are the water quality sampling sites and what type of data is available? Where are the known contaminated sites and groundwater recharge areas? Are there previous and or ongoing stream restorations? Finally, it is important to identify critical sub-watersheds containing C1 streams less than 10% impervious surface drain to water supply intakes or reservoirs. These tables describe land use and land cover reclassification in New Jersey. 
The NJDEP Level 1 Land Use Land Cover Data provides an overview of the spatial distribution of developed and undeveloped areas as well as habitat connectivity and fragmentation patterns. These data can provide useful information for many conservation efforts, but to better assess the interaction between land use and land cover and water quality, a modified classification system was developed using several steps. Starting with the Anderson Level 3 classification field provided in the land use land cover layer, similar types of wetland categories were grouped together creating six different classes of wetlands according to a prior land use land cover study in New Jersey. The remaining Level 3 data were classified as urban, agriculture, forest, water, or barren. Next, the six wet wetland classes were grouped as natural wetlands or unnatural wetlands. The natural wetlands group consisted of coastal wetlands, forested wetlands, and emergent wetlands. The disturbed wetlands were urban wetlands, agriculture wetlands, and other disturbed wetlands. Natural wetlands were grouped simply as wetlands, while the disturbed wetlands were paired with other developed classes, urban, agriculture, and barren land, as seen in the table on the left. To better understand the potential impacts that urban land use has on water quality, the polygons classified as urban were divided into three separate classes. Impervious surface for each Anderson Level 3 land use type in the study area was estimated using a weighted average to normalize the level of representation for each polygon as seen in the table on the right. The classes were created by setting impervious surface thresholds. The rural class contained land use types with less than 15% impervious surface. The low density class ranged from 15% to 30%, and the medium high class was 30% or more. Here, the layers for analysis are shown. They are land use land cover, streams, protected parcels, impervious surface, critical HUC 14, groundwater recharge, ambient biomonitoring network, and contaminated sites. The data were turned into raster layers. Then a weighted site selection analysis was set up in GIS. The initial suitability analysis focused on six of the eight data sets. The rating and weighting was based on the following six questions. One, what is the quantity of each type of land use land cover in the parcel? Two, what is the quantity of each type of land use land cover in 300 feet riparian zone in the parcel? Three, what is the status of conservation protection, if any, in the parcel? Four, is the parcel located in a critical HUC 14 area? Five, is the parcel located in a sensitive groundwater recharge area? Six, what is the percentage of impervious surface for the sub-watershed in which the parcel is located? The unique attributes that contained the information to answer the questions were rated according to the estimated level of importance with, within each individual raster layer on a scale of one to four. The ratings describe that the difference in relative importance among each attribute within the raster layer. A rating of one meant that the particular attribute did not contribute any positive value to stream restoration potential of a parcel, while a value of four indicated high stream restoration potential. For example, the protected lands raster layer rates three levels of conservation protection. The no known protection value is rated as a one, meaning it doesn't contribute to potential stream restoration. The other two options, some protection and full protection are rated as two and four respectively. This means that an area that has full protection managed for biodiversity is twice as important as an area that has some protection managed for multiple uses subject to extractive use when determining stream restoration potential. Next, the relative importance of each raster layer was given a weight. The weights were given as a decimal summing to one as seen in the table. 
The weighting of each raster layer describes the level of importance that the entirety of each raster layer contributes towards finding parcels that have the highest potential for stream restoration. For example, land use land cover that was not located in the riparian zone was given a weight of 0.15, while land use land cover located in a riparian zone was given a weight of 0.30. This means that the input for the land use land cover in riparian raster is twice as important as the input for the land use land cover not in riparian raster. The output was calculated by multiplying the integer value assigned to each raster cell rating by each raster dataset weighting. The lowest possible score was 1 and the highest possible score was 3.45. The final output from the model produced a minimum value of 1.1 and a maximum value of 2.95 as seen in the figure on the left. To test the model, existing C1 streams were added to the output as seen in the figure on the right. The logic implied by this validation method was that areas with high potential for C2 stream restoration should contain or border existing C1 streams. Although land use land cover in riparian areas were weighted heavily, the validation remained objective as C1 and C2 streams were not treated independently in the model. The initial suitability analysis output was given a raster layer with a cell size of 100 feet squared. To narrow down the selection with additional spatial analyses and determine the areas that were most suitable for additional analysis, the raster was converted to a polygon feature class. Raster to polygon conversion requires reclassification of decimal values to integer values. Reclassification values were grouped into five classes where groups one and two contained 50% of the highest ranking cells as seen in the table. To narrow the selection area for further analysis, these two groups were used. Prior to final analysis, the preliminary high ranking areas were intersected with the protected parcels layer as seen in the figure on the right. There are both positive and negative elements when discussing additional considerations for selection. For instance, one should ask, is there an eligible stream in the parcel? And are C1 streams connected to C2 in the parcel? The initial suitability analysis located several areas with a high potential for restoration that were disqualified by the subsequent refinement. Many of the high ranking areas in the initial analysis were removed by the C1 to C2 connectivity requirement. While it is true that C2 streams connected to C1 streams are often more suitable for anti-degradation upgrade, the absence of C1 water in the study area severely limits this connection. In addition, it is important to ask about known contaminated sites in the parcel and whether the AMNET biodiversity score in HUC 14 of the parcel was poor. The minimum area of suitability was 10 acres regardless of the parcel size. Parcels that intersected the 10 acre area were selected. The individual parcel sizes ranged from 17.4 to 163.9 acres. Limitations such as the cost of restoration should be evaluated. Land ownership has consistently posed problems in previous studies, so a filter could be applied to eliminate certain types of ownership. Grant eligibility is another important concern. The approval of new NJDEP total maximum daily load levels may create funding opportunities in areas with slightly lower restoration potential that should not be neglected. Measuring the stream bank length that might become eligible for anti-degradation upgrades, habitat connectivity in and beyond the parcels, as well as public accessibility to the area are also key factors in decision making.
Here, you can find a list of sources which were used in the making of this presentation and PowerPoint. Thank you.